Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on probabilistic reasoning and machine learning. Today we talk about support vector machines. And for me, when I first thought, heard about support vector machines, I really wanted to learn about it because of the cool name, right? I mean, support vector machine. Wow, this is like Turing machine. So if we know the Turing machine, we should also, of course, know the support vector machine, right? Of course, it's something completely different. It has nothing to do with models of computation or something. But it is a cool title, right? If you translate it in German, it would be like Stützvektormaschine or maybe Stützvektormethod. That sounds more like Stützstrümpfe or something else. So that's more boring somehow. But support vector machine, that's exciting. So let's learn about it today. And it is an exciting topic. But let's see what have we have seen so far. So this is like the lectures or at least the topics that we've seen so far. So we did a lot of probabilities at the beginning. And maybe you were frustrating about thinking, am I here in a statistics class? So why all these probabilities? The reason being, those are the basics. And I try to teach you the basics in probabilities more from a computer science perspective, right? When you take a typical math lecture, typically you have like definition, lemma, and then that's or theorem or something. And here I try to use a slightly different style, more focusing on the ideas and maybe having lots of topics and lots of content, but typically more hand wavy, right? I don't care so much for uniqueness and um, existence results. So those are like super tough stuff. Usually if you want to do it properly in mathematics, I trust on the mathematicians that they did a good job, that all this exists that we are talking about and all these things. Just to I, I try to present it like as simple as possible, more like a new data structure that you learn, okay? And um, from the AI perspective, I find it interesting that pro probabilities can be seen as a generalization of logic, right? So that's something which I find interesting. And it's very different from how you usually teach these things, right? In um, uh, probability theory, I think you don't start with logic, but I think um, you right away start with random variables and maybe with Kolmogorov axioms and these kind of stuff. Um, the other things are a couple of technical things like the Gaussian distribution. So why a whole lecture on it? By now it should be clear, like the Gaussian distribution is something like linear algebra. Yeah? It is very much like linear algebra. It's something that can always be used to approximate more complicated stuff just by looking at the mean and the covariance matrix. So that's a linear approximation to something more complicated. However, it's like a linear approximation in the exponent of the exponential function. So it's somewhat cool, somewhat more advanced, but the idea is very similar. So we have something complicated that we can't do, some super complicated integrals that we can't compute. Let's approximate our super complicated distribution with the Gaussian distribution. And then we apply all the clever formulas from this lecture on Gaussian distributions, right? And that's, for example, the Laplace method that I just described. So that's like a very typical thing. And so these integrals that you have there, yeah, they are well behaved when you have Gaussian distributions. And then typically you can do many calculations. Of course, there are other things. And then that's interesting to have these relationship between estimation, yeah, point estimates, and posterior distributions. I think that's a very interesting insight. And then finally, we, we came to our first real method, linear regression. And we did some machine learning, learning a function from input to output with some um, model, which is linear in the parameters. Okay, So that was the start. Then again, we had some technicality. So I said, calculating. Um, derivatives is super important. That's why you got a, a quick course in matrix differential calculus. Maybe a topic that you never heard before about it. That's the same for me. I think I learned it in 2010 or something. I never seen it at university before. But I think it's super useful, in particular for machine learning, because we have to calculate derivatives all over the place for neural networks and also for Lagrange methods and everywhere, okay? Um, then we stopped a bit and talked about model selection. Again, talking really about model selection, um, from the classical point of view, you just do this cross-validation idea, which is intuitively quite clear. But there's also this Bayesian type of model selection, which is like conceptually really nice. And it gives you some deeper insight into how these things work, right? Since we typically assume, even if we don't talk about it, that the data is coming in as a random variable in a way. And so it's interesting that this Bayesian 
model selection method is out there as well. And it's, it's common in the Bayesian community as well. So what are we doing today? Now for something completely different. Yeah, you probably know the quote. So now we have to reset our brains and let's forget about probabilities. Let's take the perspective of machine learning like in the year 2000 where people were talking about support vector machines and they were talking about it classically. However, there are of course probability distributions as well. But in the context of support vector machines, the probability distributions are not like the main actor, like the main way to, um, to talk about the problem and then to derive a method using Bayes' rule. Instead, we, are, we'll, we will have mathematical optimization as the main tool. And so we will talk about Lagrangian methods today, okay, an optimization problem, which is a super powerful tool in itself. Okay, so here's the classification problem. So we talked about regression. That's where we have patterns and estimate a real number. In classification, we have patterns and we estimate a discrete class label. For example, the simplest one, binary class label. So we only have two classes. So the patterns could be pictures um, of animals and then the two class labels could be cats and dogs. Okay, so just that. You don't want to estimate the weight or continuous number, but instead you just want to estimate a single class label. And again, the thing switches off. So I don't know who to contact here, why these things switch off. If anyone of you know, so is there an email address like fixit at tu Dortmund? So that would be useful. Please send an email that they fix it maybe. So classification problem means we are given some data, some example images with some known class labels. <coughs> and now the goal is to find an input-output function. So a function f that takes such a pattern and which spits out the label, right? That's super useful because, uh, for example, you can use it for handwritten digit recognition or you can, whatever, have it for in your photos app on your iPhone, right? So then you have a couple of examples. This is your grandmother, this is your whatever, your aunt, and then ideally from a couple of examples, some support vector machine possibly learns the pattern and learns the function so that it can classify new images, okay? So it's a super useful problem. Um, Graphically, let's also put a picture on the board. That's always good. So um, for the regression problem, we had here the x, and then here we had the y on the other axis, and we were kind of estimating a curve. Um, here now we will have an x1 and x2, basically saying our examples are coming from R2. Okay, so those are the patterns. Of course, if it's a picture of your grandmother, we will have a thousand axes, or maybe even a million axes if you have a megapixel camera on your phone, okay? So you have many axes, but in principle, this is a cartoon of the situation. And you have a couple of, let's say, positive example of your grandmother and a couple of other pictures of other people where maybe there's also a face on, but it's a different person, okay? And now what we, what we would like to learn would be a function f going from the r squared just into the discrete set of one plus one and minus one, okay? That's it. And so basically this function will assign um, every point in the plane here, either a plus one or a, or a minus one. And in this case, yeah, we should probably have somewhere here some boundary and we should say everyone on this side is plus one, everyone on the other side is minus one. Okay, now this boundary by chance is just a straight line, okay, looking very pretty. Of course, it could be more complicated. Suppose there's carnival, okay, and somehow your grandmother is, is kind of wearing a hat and looking very differently, having a funny glasses or something, and somehow it pops up here to the other person. Then possibly the boundary, of course, could be also like this. So that it could be also some nonlinear boundary, right? So it could be arbitrarily complicated. So far, so good. Let's, for our, in our heads, let's keep this in mind, yeah? So um, just for the, to get, give, give the right vocabulary here, classification problems are an instance of a supervised learning problem. You remember from the first lecture where I distinguished supervised and unsupervised learning, where the distinction is basically in supervised learning we have input and output patterns or input and output examples and in unsupervised learning I only have input examples, okay? 
And um, so the, if I have input and output, I have supervised learning. And if I only have inputs, I have unsupervised learning. Now, who's the supervisor here? Basically, the labels are given from a teacher, right? So the teacher is supervising the machine or the method so to do the right thing. And so if, if it doesn't give the right label, then the teacher, the supervisor, can say, oh, I know the true label. That is the cat image, OK? But you said it's a dog image. So that's a mistake. So please correct your parameters. OK, so that's the supervising that happens here. Um, the next um, classification here is that we are looking today at the separable case, OK? That basically means there is a gap between the examples, OK? So here is a gap. So there's an area where there's nothing. So basically, we have two clusters. However, it doesn't have to be like that. It could be also something like, like this. Uh, now I use circles instead of minus. So you see they are kind of mixed, and the somehow decision boundary maybe looks like this, somewhat complicated. But maybe it's just noise. There could be noise on the labels. And so they could have a wrong label. And that's the reason. And actually, we should also just say there's a straight line, yeah, and everything is fine. So but today we look, this is a non-separable case, so there's no, no area of low density, basically, between the classes. But today, we look at the more simplistic case of the separable uh, situation. In the non-separable case, as I just said, the two classes overlap as probability distributions. I said the word. Even though today we are not talking so much about probability distribution, that's what we keep in our mind. Of course, there are samples from a probability distribution. Yeah? We always think like that about this data. OK, the next thing we are talking today about is only about the linear case. In this case, I'm not talking about linear and the parameter. In this case, I'm saying the separation is linear. OK, so we can separate the two classes by a straight line. And again, I gave you the example already. So if there's some curve or something to split the, the data, then, then that's a nonlinear case. But if I can draw a straight line, that's a linear separable case. So far, so good. There's, of course, a nonlinear case. And we will look at that one too. So today is about the separable linear case. Next week. Oh no, Wednesday will be the non-separable linear case. And maybe already next week, uh, we will have the nonlinear, non-separable case, so the fully general one. However, first you have to understand today before you understand the next lecture, OK? Um, so more general, OK, so more words. We talked about, about classification problem, the function or algorithm that solves the classification problem, so we could call it a classifier. So a support vector machine is a classifier, OK? And then there are linear classifiers and nonlinear classifiers. I hope that's no surprise to you. So this is the overview of the support vector machine lecture. That's also the reason why I have 226 slides on this topic. However, as you know, those are the, diff the, the builds in between. So there are fewer slides in total. I'm already on page 13, even though that I have here page 6 down here. OK, so let's start with the linearly separable case. So um, let's assume yeah, that our patterns are linearly separable into two classes. Yeah? And the two classes are, of course, the output that we want to generate. So here's already the answer that we will learn today and that we will derive today. Okay? So we will derive the linear support vector machine, which is a supervised learning method for the classification problem. So far, so good. Um, and the way it solves the problem, it cuts the space of patterns. Yeah? So it draws somehow a line between the patterns into two parts um, by choosing the so-called max margin hyperplane. Okay? So what is a hyperplane? I will explain in more detail in a second. But basically, a hyperplane is a straight line in 2D. And in 3D, it's a plane. And in 4D, it's a hyperplane. Okay, So it's just a general way of saying I can split it with a straight line into two parts. The surprising thing is that if I'm looking for the max margin hyperplane, this problem can be formulated as a constraint optimization problem. Okay, So you might know what an optimization problem is. It is typically either maximum or minimum. And you can solve it with gradient descent, for example. We haven't talked about it so much, but I think it popped up already last time with the Bayesian model selection example. And a constraint optimization problem is where we not only have a function that we want to minimize or maximize, but we have some side conditions. Okay, So the ST 
stands for such that. Okay, so we want to minimize a particular function such that some inequality or equality constraint is fulfilled. So and today we first will derive this problem from this max margin intuition, and then I will also show you how you can solve it with Lagrange multipliers. And we do some calculations, and maybe I run over time. But that's no problem, then we continue next time. So we have, it's a big topic. We can split it into several lectures. So far, so good. I think I'm, I'm so far I'm talking about the whole thing so redundantly that you're all bored. And once it gets more difficult, it's too fast. So in that case, you have to stop me, right? If I'm getting too fast, it's the difficult stuff. So how can we derive this problem? So how can maximizing the margin be formulated as a constraint optimization problem? For this now, we need to go intellectually through a couple of steps. And as always in these kind of lectures, every step is simple, but the whole thing at the end then is non-trivial. So first of all, what is a hyperplane, OK? So a hyperplane yeah, can be specified by some pair WB, yeah, where the W is some vector of the same size as my patterns x, and the B is some real number. Yeah? So basically, the w is a vector giving us the orientation of the hyperplane, and the b is the offset from the origin. So, but mathematically, we could also say, so the hyperplane consists of all the points x, where basically the inner product between the vector w and my pattern x with some offset is equal to 0. And in the support vector machine literature, it's very common to write the inner product with these brackets, with these um, uh, these sharp, what are they called? Square? No, it's not the square, triangular brackets, whatever. Yeah, they have a name. So that's like a physicist notation for the inner product, okay? And we will also use it because that's just how the papers look like. But it is just the inner product. So far, so good. Now, what does it mean for a hyperplane to be a separating hyperplane given some data with some labels? That basically means that the inner product calculated for a particular pattern shifted by b is greater than 0 for all positive examples and less than 0 for all negative examples. Okay? So far, so good. This can be also nicely written, yeah? just as um, that this number here multiplied by the class label, which was plus and minus 1, should be greater than 0 for all i. Okay? So that's like a very clever way of getting both cases into one statement that looks more innocent. Um, maybe let's look a little bit at this inner product thing, why the inner product is defining a hyperplane. Yeah? I know this might be just, just linear algebra, but I'm not sure whether you are still aware of the details. So why does the inner product help us with defining a hyperplane? So for this, we need to understand what the inner product is really calculating. So let's take we have a vector w. That is my vector w. And let's assume for simplicity that the length of this vector w is equal to 1. Okay? Um, by the way, what does this mean, this bars around the w? Okay? So that is the length of the vector. So the length of the vector, how is it defined? Um, okay, we can use Pythagoras, right? So that is w1 and that is w2. And then the length is typically defined to be the square root of w1 squared plus w2 squared, and then takes the square root. Now let's rewrite this, right? I mean, we are fans of linear algebra, so let's write it with linear algebra, right? So it can be also written as the inner product of the vector with itself, and then taking the square root. Again, why is taking the square root making sense? When you look at the units, so w1 is in centimeters, w2 is in centimeters, the length should be in centimeters. But if we square it, we have centimeter square, so there must be somewhere a square root that gets rid of that. Okay? So that is the length. That's also why sometimes we just write the squared length. Okay? Why? Because it looks so nice. It looks even simpler. Okay, so that is the length. That's the first use of the inner product that you can do. If you plug in a vector twice, you get the length squared. So now, suppose we have another vector. Let's take this one. OK, that's x. Now, what if I project it down onto my w? Now I'm interested in the length of this one. And that happens to be exactly the inner product of w times x. OK? 
So the inner product W transpose X is calculating the length in centimeters here, okay, of this projection. Um, however, the assumption here is that the length of W is equal to 1. Otherwise, that doesn't work, right? So otherwise, this is not really the appropriate length. We can also, this vector, we can also give it a name. And basically, it's W transpose X, which is the length, times vector W. Okay, now, basically, we scale this vector by this length. Uh, this can be also rewritten, and again, you need, we need to be a bit careful. So this is a scalar, and this is a vector. Yeah, so we, this is not a matrix, matrix multiplication, but this is a scalar vector multiplication in this case, or a scalar matrix multiplication. But I usually prefer to write it in such a way that all multiplications are matrix matrix. So let's put the W to the front. Yeah, in principle, we can do that. There's no problem. It's now a vector scalar the other way around. But now when we look at the shapes, we have a column vector times a row vector times a column vector. And so the inner dimensions here match. So I can also change it like that. Okay? And that's nice because this is, is a matrix, right? And that matrix is a projection matrix of W. So it's projecting my W, uh, my X onto W. And my, you might have heard that projection matrices, if you project a, a, mat a vector onto some other vector, yeah, I can project again, again, again. The result shouldn't change, okay? So that's, let's see whether that's true. So let's see if I project twice, whether it's the same as projecting it only once, okay? So let's plug everything in. Then we see that we have W transpose, W transpose times X. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I omitted already the brackets because everything is matrix matrix, so everything is fine. Um, surprisingly, in between here, I have a W transpose W, and that was equal to 1, OK? So the whole thing is equal to the projection matrix of X. So this matrix is idempotent or idempotent some notion that you might have heard in linear algebra. Okay, what if the vector w doesn't have length 1? Yeah, then we need to normalize it. Okay, how do we normalize it? We divide by its length. So instead of using w, uh, we can also normalize its length. Yeah? And um, let's check it that this guy really has length 1. For this, we need to multiply the vector with itself, where I already took out some factors here. And if you write it out, the bottom part here, you have W transpose W divided by, yes, this is the square root of W transpose W, square root of W transpose W, and that is equal to 1. So this thing, the, the W divided by this one has the right length, OK? Um, in particular, we could apply it also up here, and then you get nice, more general projection matrices. Yeah? OK, so far so good. So this is a, a quick reminder of linear algebra. So what does it buy us, um, this projection business? So what does it have to do with getting a linear separating hyperplane? So where is the hyperplane? The hyperplane is basically this line, which is orthogonal to my w. Okay, and now the inner product of any vector yeah, with, with my w is calculating how far away am I from the plane. Okay, so w transpose x tells me how far away I'm from the plane. Now let's say the w is not normalized. Still it works. It is just that this number cannot be interpreted anymore in terms of the w. However, if I'm having one vector up here, x2, it will pr get projected over here, and the number I get will be larger than the number I get for x1, which is closer to the plane. OK? So far, so good. So here's the origin. Now, how can we shift this? Let's say our, my positive class is here, my negative class is here. Then basically, I want to have it shifted over there. So that can be done by just um, shifting it with a constant. 
shifting the zero point to somewhere else. So here the x1 might get 5, the x2 might get a projection of 10. By shifting it with uh, minus 7, yeah, basically then I could get a hyperplane over there. Great. OK, so what's my function here? My function was x gets mapped onto w. Ah, no, that's not the function. OK, sorry. This is my function that is defining a hyperplane. OK, and basically now if I say find a hyperplane with good properties in such a setting is basically trying lots of different w's which correspond to different hyperplanes centered at the origin. And once I have one which is kind of reasonable, I can shift it with the b. Ideally, of course, I do it simultaneously. So I can optimize in the b and in the w. So our optimization problem at the end will be something with the w and the b, of course, right? OK, so far so good, linear algebra reactivated or understood, ideally, right? If you didn't like linear algebra by now, I, I mean, now you should like it, right? Even if you hated it until, t until yesterday. OK, um, ah, here we come to the function f now. So I have my hyperplane defined, great. And then I just take the sign. So I'm just asking, do I have a number positive or a negative number? And that is just giving me the class label, the estimate of the class label. OK, great. OK, that's our first notion. Um, and now we have to learn something about hyperplanes. There are canonical hyperplanes. There are some different variations to it. So first notion is, or we could also, if we were now mathematicians, we would say lemma. So here's a lemma. So suppose you have a separating hyperplane given by w and b, OK? Then here's another one. If you multiply the w and the b with some scalar c, yeah, you get another hyperplane. And surprisingly, it's the same, at least if the scalar is positive. OK? So the scaling of the w and the b doesn't matter. And um, it can be very sim easily shown. Basically, um, if one hyperplane says for a particular data instance xi, yi, it's positive, then I can also multiply both sides with the constant c. OK, so I multiply the 0 with the c. So the, ze the 0 will kill the c. It's the c is a positive number, so the greater sign doesn't flip sides. It's still a greater sign. And then the c could be dragged into the inner product here and into the scalar offset. OK? And the other way around, if I have this plane over there, I can drag out the c. And since c is a positive number, I can just divide by the c and it's gone. OK? So the separating hyperplane yeah, um, can be described, a single separating hyperplane can be described by infinitely many pairs of w and b. OK? And how should we choose the constant? Um, let's use some convention. And then we call that the canonical representation of the hyperplane. So here's the canonical separating hyperplane. Um, first of all, this expression that we used already quite a while now, but now multiplied with the class label as well, this is called the so-called functional margin. Yeah, and this is just a vocabulary. This is just a name. Okay, So this is the functional margin. And now we say a separating hyperplane is called canonical. Yeah, as, as you know, the separating hyperplane is specified by a pair. So in principle, now being very rigorous, if wb and uh, c times w and c times b, they are two different hyperplanes because they have two different representations, but they describe the same like actual hyperplane that is relevant for us. And we say a separating hyperplane is canonical if um, the functional margin is 1 yeah, for the, uh, the smallest functional margin across my data set is 1. So for this definition here, I need my data set x1 to xn and y1 to um, yn. And I say um, I can compute these numbers for all my data point, And I choose the c in such a way that the smallest value is equal to 1. Okay, so that is then called a canonical hyperplane. Um, note that it must be a separating hyperplane. Otherwise, I possibly cannot calculate the functional margin. Uh, I can calculate the functional margin. I cannot calculate a smallest functional margin because some of these numbers might be negative. Okay, and then the minimum is not defined. So the minimum here is only defined if I have a separating hyperplane. 
Okay, so far so good. So you see it gets a little bit more technical. Um, the insight here is that for any W and B, yeah, you can find an equivalent hyperplane just by rescaling, okay, with some positive factor. Um, and note that by making a given hyperplane canonical, that doesn't change the decision function. Okay, so the decision stays the same. So that was the statement up here. If I rescale, the decision is the same. So far, so good. You see, it gets a bit technical, and the question is, so what were we looking for? Yes, we wanted to get to margins. We wanted to maximize some margin, ideally, where I haven't explained to you what it is. Maybe that's a good point to do it now. So what is this margin thing I haven't defined? So let's go back to intuition, okay? So I can put many straight lines in here. Which one should I choose? Which one is a good one? Okay, I could choose that one. However, here's another one that's also separating the data. And this is where we have now the notion of a margin. So the margin is now defined like this road. This can go between the two classes, yeah? And the margin is basically the width of this road. And as you see, when I now rotate this plane, I have a wider road. So I would say I have a wider margin. So I have two separating hyperplanes. Which one do you prefer? I prefer the one with the maximum margin. OK? And now, as you've seen already in this, oh yeah, I switched. As you've seen in this calculation, somehow projecting the data here, so this w transpose times x, that is giving me some numbers. Yeah? And so somehow they can be arbitrarily rescaled. That's why I need this canonical thing. So I somehow want to have that this distance here like, is equal to 1. So that's what my canonical hyperplane will be at the end. However, basically this is calculating me the distance from the, hy from the separating hyperplane. And I want to have the, the offset as large as possible. So far, so good. So Next thing, so we talked about the functional margin. So what was the functional margin? It was just this expression up here, just the expression that we use so often already. Okay? Here's another one, the geometrical margin. So the geometrical margin is obtained by basically rescaling a functional margin with the norm of w. Okay? So this can be done, and it can be also dragged into the w and into the b. Okay? So now that's a good wording here, because as I said, if I have a vector of length 1, then the inner product really calculates the length in centimeters. So then it really calculates the geometric distance of this point from my separating plane. That's why it's called geometric margin. Okay? <clears throat> so far, so good. Um, now the geometrical margin now helps us to choose between different hyperplanes, because now we are comparable. If I have two hyperplanes, yeah, think of normalizing the, um, the weight vector to length 1, do it for both possible candidate hyperplanes, and then look which one has the smaller margin, the smaller minimal margin inside, um, yeah, between the classes. So let's define the margin now. The margin, so this is the notion where we wanted to get, but we defined it only for a canonical separating hyperplane. So we made already some adjustments to the parameter. Yeah? So, and we say the margin of a canonical separating hyperplane now is basically the smallest distance to the separating hyperplane ab among all examples. Yeah? So it is a minimal geometrical margin. So the expression in between here is like really measuring in centimeters the distance to the separating hyperplane, right? Because we divide by 1 divided by w. However, the starting point is the canonical separating hyperplane to be comparable. And if you now go through um, this, I can first drag out the normalization constant. And so I'm ending up with a minimum over all these functional margin. And since I'm here talking about the canonical separating hyperplane, I know that this minimum is equal to 1. OK, so everything is choosing, uh, chosen so that, uh, that the margin can be easily computed. So let's flip back. So the functional margin was just this expression, OK? So that was just the functional margin. Um, then the canonical separating hyperplane was one where basically 
this functional margin um, as a minimum across all the data to be 1, OK? And then we get the geometric margin, which is the one measure, measured in centimeters. And then we can define what is the margin, so a measure of width to compare these different streets between the data points here um, of a canonical separating hyperplane. And as it turns out, for canonical separating hyperplanes, the margin can be calculated just by 1 divided the norm of w. Okay? And that's where we wanted to get to. We wanted to have a nice expression for the margin and to define that in a reasonable way. Why do we have it so complicated? Because we can arbitrarily scale the w, and we need to get rid of the scaling. That's why we need these canonical hyperplanes as well. OK, so we want to have a max margin classifier. We want to have one which is maximizing the width, the distance between the positive and negative example. So since the margin is 1 divided by the length of w, yeah, maximizing the margin is the same as minimizing the norm of w. OK, so far so good. If I minimize the norm of w, I'm maximizing 1 divided the norm of w. Um, that's part of my optimization problem down here already. I'm minimizing now the norm of my w. Yeah, that is maximizing the margin. However, that is not enough. Of course, I need to ensure that I'm only talking about the separating hyperplanes, OK? So I need to have, I have to ensure that my hyperplane WB that I'm looking at is really separating the data. So I need side constraints, OK? And the side constraints are just that the functional margin should be greater or equal to 1 for all data points, OK? So let's write it as side conditions. and. Let's think, so what's happening if I minimize the w, right? Why not just let it go to the origin, let it go to 0? So what will happen? At some point, these side conditions, they kick in, right? Because the functional margin here, the inner product gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So I can get really small and get close to 0. And if I'm just doing it for one of the classes or the b, trying to use the b to exchange it, I'm not separating anymore, OK? So here's this a nice trade-off. In the one hand, I want to have a very small w. On the other hand, the w should really separate the data. OK? So that's the derivation of my optimization problem. Um, so far, so good. Any questions? So the steps are just a little bit involved. As I said, every step is simple. It's simple to understand what a canonical hyperplane is. It's simple to understand what a functional margin is or what a geometric margin is. Simple to understand what a margin is, and when you build everything together, you end up with an optimization problem. OK, just a side question. Could we replace this number 1? It looks like a magic number, right? Could we replace it with any other number? Yeah? Any ideas? Yes? Yeah, that's right. OK, but would the optimization problem also work if I would put a 17? What, what will happen? OK, I, I tell you, if I put a 17, it's like saying canonical hyperplanes are the ones where the smallest functional margin is 17. So it was an arbitrary choice to say, what are the canonical hyperplanes? So with a different choice, I would get a different number here. However, some numbers are forbidden, so they should be negative. That's a bad idea. Um, however, um, there's another number which is forbidden, which is a 0. So 0 is also not allowed. So the functional margin must be some positive number. But it could be any positive number, right? But the convention is that it's a 1. So to see that we could also have a 17 down here, you start through the whole process again, and you say canonical hyperplane, blah, 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 equal to 17. So let's again write it nicely again. So maximizing the margin while ensuring separation can be written as a mathematical optimization problem. Um, and I think, do you do these things in, in, a, in numerics classes? Are you taking numerics classes? Are you doing it in MAFI or somewhere? OK, then you do it now. So this is then your, your first optimization problem. But the mathematics behind this is very general. And you can apply to many different questions that you might have in the future. So you have a, a minimization of a function. That's like Kurven discussion, right? Calculate derivatives and whatever, go on. 
Um, however, you have these complicated side conditions, and that's what makes it a bit more nasty, and that's what turns it into a constraint optimization problem. Now, this thing is called the primal problem, and so if there's a primal problem, there's typically also a dual problem, and the dual problem is a different formulation of this optimization. And so, typically, you can choose, you can solve the primal problem if you like it, if you like the functions, if you have a solver for that one, or you can derive another problem, the so-called dual problem, and maybe that has better properties and is easier to solve. And how to do that, we will see next, okay? So, of course, first solution is you just run it with your optimizer if you have some software for that, and of course there is software, and the alternative is to derive a different formulation which might be simpler. That is done by using Lagrange multipliers. And then you have a different version of your problem, and it doesn't matter whether you solve the primal or the dual problem. Of course, you could also calculate the dual of the dual, or the dual of the dual of the dual, and you can th think about whether at some point this process terminates and you get always the same one, or whether you might get a nicer and nicer and nicer version. Yeah? But as you know, there, typically, there are difficult problems, and difficult problems sometimes get a little bit simpler, but not too simple. So how to do this now? So let's derive a dual problem. Okay, so you could plug this into an optimizer, but let's, the, the typical solution for support vector machines is not to do this, but to derive the dual. And in the linearly separable case, that's actually a bit overkill, okay? Actually, in the linearly separable case, you can just plug this into an optimizer, and I show you in my Jupyter notebook today how to do this and to solve this. However, later on, when we will talk about the nonlinear, non-separable case, we need the dual problem. And of course, we could derive it like in, in, in two lectures. However, then we have much more luggage with us. We have a nonlinear situation, we have a non-separable case, everything is more advanced. So let's, for, for fun, let's derive the dual problem for the simpler situation, for the separable case, okay? For this now comes a quick reminder of method of Lagrange multiplier and KKT multiplier. Um, I won't try to explain why it works exactly. I tried that last year. You can still see my, my failure in, in the, on the video somewhere on the Mediathek at the Heinrich Heine University. But then I think two years or three years ago, I think I did a good job and I explained it nicely. So better look at the older version if you want to have more information. Let's see how I'm doing it today. So, First of all, there is nice explanations on the web. For example, from Andrew Engie's machine learning lecture, they are numbered in, in Stanford, CS229. Um, there's a nice, there are nice lecture notes, and that's what I tried to follow like two, two years ago. There are also a couple of nice books. One is called Convex Optimization from Stephen Boyd, and that is a really, really nice math book. It is a math book, but it's written for people like you, for computer scientists, in my opinion. So it's like very accessible. It's not a super tough, very dense book, but it's a very verbose explaining book. Yeah? So it's super useful. And it's also super useful because you can just click on the link and you have the data, you have the, the, this book. And this is not some weird foreign server. This is officially from the website of the author, and he's fine with you copying a PDF version of it. He also has another nice new book from 2018 called Applied Linear Algebra, which is also super useful. If you didn't like linear algebra so far, have a look at this book. Okay, so now comes nonlinear optimization with equality constraints. So this is um, already sounding more fancy than what we've seen so far. So let's first look at general cases, how to do constraint optimization and how to derive dual problems. And then we will apply this more general point of view to the support vector machine. So our goal is to solve um, this optimization problem, which is now more general than the one that we've seen before. So we say we have some objective function f of w, okay? And we have some equality constraint. So that's simpler compared to what we've seen so far. We had inequality constraint, but let's first look at the simpler case of equality constraints. Yeah, and the equality constraint is also defined by some function h sub i, okay? However, it could be just a matrix times a vector. It could be something simple if we have a linear case, but it could be something complicated. How can we solve this? So the first option, as I said, you just directly plug it into a so-called solver. And, um, okay, just to show you how this could look like, um, so here's a solver for quadratic programming. I just 
go into the detail in a second, but suppose you have some minimization problem yeah, that is given on your sheet of paper, yeah, like being a mathematician, you write something down. Then there's some code from scipy.optimize. There's a function called minimize. And this function minimize takes some function, a starting point. It takes some bounds for the variable. And it takes some constraints. And so now if I implement all these constraints and this function properly, I can just call this function minimize. OK, so this is a solver. And possibly you can just directly plug it into a solver. However, you can also first do some massaging using the method of Lagrange multiplier to turn it into a possibly simpler problem. So how we do this? So first we turn this constrained problem into a so-called unconstrained problem. Unconstrained problem is great. That's just curving discussion in principle, right? So that's just minimizing a function going downhill or whatever. However, the unconstrained problem is a more complicated function than the one that we had before. Basically, all these equality constraints, yeah, they now pop up in this new function. Yeah, so we have the function that we actually want to minimize plus some linear combination of all my functions that should be equal to 0. And each of these functions now, they get another variable in front, beta i. Okay? And those are the so-called Lagrange multipliers. So they are multiplied with the constraints. So instead of having now a function in the variables that I want to optimize, I have for every constraint <coughs> one new variable, beta sub i. OK, so the price is my function got more complicated, and I have more variables. So if I now write out the dual problem, uh, I basically now do a clever way of transforming my unconstrained problem into an optimization problem of the new variables beta. And as you can imagine, the w is from the primal problem, so the w is our primal variable. And the beta now is towards our dual problem, so those are the dual variables. So ideally, I first minimize for a given beta with respect to w, my more complicated function. Yeah? So I choose some beta, whatever, randomly. And then I can minimize my function in terms of w. And the solution is some number. So ideally, yeah, I can get a closed form solution for this expression here. So ideally, I can take the derivatives of these Lagrangian, yeah, set it to 0, solve it for w, and plug it into this bigger expression to get rid of all the occurrences of my w. And then I end up with a function that is only a function in beta, which I then can optimize completely unconstrained. And that would be the dual problem. However, sometimes that's not so easy. Sometimes I cannot eliminate the w, and then maybe the dual problem is not of help. But if I can eliminate the w, yeah, then I'm in business again, and I have an unconstrained problem in beta. Now it's a maximization problem. And I can plug it into a solver and just run it. Um, of course, why not plug it up here? Because that one might be more complicated, and you might not have this scipy minimize function already. Maybe you have something simpler, because you implemented just a gradient descent. You might ask, so, but I have scipy, so why not use it? Possibly you are programming in Go, or you are programming in Haskell, or you are programming in some other weird language. And that's your, your thing. Okay? And there is no optimizer, so you have to do it yourself. Okay? So there are many reasons why you should try to understand it. The other secret here that I haven't told you is, so now why maximization? Why minimize and maximize? So that is going deeper into the Lagrange multiplier method. And I skip it. Okay? It's just a maximum problem. And why it's a maximum problem, there's more theory behind it. Yeah? I just want to give you the superficial information that we need for the support vector machine. OK, so I could have a more general problem. So the more general problem not only have equality constraints, but also inequality constraint. And the first surprising thing is, why do we write them like this? Why less than or equal to 0? We will see in a second. Okay. Of course, it doesn't matter. It's just a matter of plus minus, multiplying with plus minus. So how do we do this one? Again, there are solvers for this one. There's scipy.minimize, so scipy.optimize.minimize. So that works well. You can do this. However, sometimes you can also use the Lagrange multiplier, in this case, sometimes also called KKT multiplier, because it's from Karouche, Kuhn, Tucker, and not from Lagrange. Um, 
The strategy is the same. We first transform our constraint problem into some unconstrained problem by formulating the so-called Lagrangian function. Of course, maybe this should, should be called the KKT function, right? But it's also called the Lagrangian, so the Lagrange function. So how does it look like? It's basically the same as before, but now additionally, we also have a summation for our inequality constraints with even more variables. So now we have primal variable w and we have dual variables alpha and beta. However, there's a subtlety. Yeah? I cannot just maximize over alpha and beta this expression, but I have another new constraint that the alphas must be positive. Yeah? Why is that? Yeah, somehow, I mean, the, the alpha, if they are negative, then if I optimize in the w and minimize the whole thing, yeah, I, I just let this thing go to infinity and then the whole thing goes to um, minus infinity. So things can go very bad if the alphas are negative. However, the exact details I'm omitting. Look at the book from Stephen Boyd. They explain it really nicely. Let's look from our perspective more like at the API, right? So how can we use this for our support vector machine? So if you have a problem like this, we write out the Lagrangian. Again, we have this inner expression that we want to simplify. We want to get rid of this minimization over W. So ideally, we find a closed form solution in terms of W for that one. And for the support vector machine, you can. And then you have an optimization problem in alpha and beta, and you plug it into a solver. OK? Um, so we started with constraints, and here we have a new constraint. So what does it buy us? So Constraints like alpha greater or equal to zero are really nice constraints, right? So they are really simple compared to something possi possibly super nonlinear up here. Okay? So we have a dual problem with simpler constraints. So we made some progress of so solving this. Okay, so far so good. Um, I think uh, one more thing I need to say. Um, the question is, of course, will the primal and the dual problem always give the same solution somehow? Do we end up with the same solution for the Lagrangian? Not always. However, if f, g, and h are convex functions, yeah, so if they have nice properties, yeah, in that case, it doesn't matter which one we solve. Okay? And we have some additional nice properties, which I, I show in a minute. So what is convexity? Does everyone know what convexity is? I guess not. So the simple thing to say is convexity is one step away from linearity. OK, why am I saying this? Let's look at this definition. So if function f is a convex function, yeah, if you take two points yeah, and you look at the linear combination of x1 and x2 in input space and you transform it, it's less than or equal to the linear combination of the outputs. So now imagine having here equality, then that is just linearity. Yeah. But of course, linearity could be violated in two directions. So sometimes maybe it's smaller, sometimes it's larger. However, if it's always less than or equal, we call this function convex. Okay? And let's draw a picture for that one. So I need to memorize. So the function value is smaller than the actual function values of the neighbor. So let's, let's draw a picture for that one. So where do we have space? Let's get rid of the linear algebra reminder. And I need more chalk. OK. So let's look at this function. OK. And we have here some x1. and some corresponding value, OK? Let's take another point over here. So that is x2. And we have some corresponding value, f of x2, OK? And now if I recall right, yeah, the statement was something about f of x1 and f of x2, where we multiply some numbers in front of this. But it's just a linear combination, right? This is like an alpha, and this is like a beta. Yeah? i tell you in a second why to do it like this. But in principle, it's just a linear combination. So let's look at this one. So it's this function point plus that function point. And 
Basically, I'm comparing it with gamma times x1 plus 1 minus gamma times x2. And I should be smaller. So now, what about this alpha and beta or gamma? So the gamma is the number between 0 and 1 in this case. OK. So what does it mean? If the gamma is equal to 0, I'm basically at x2. If the gamma is equal to 1, I'm at x1. What if the gamma is equal to 1 half? I'm taking 1 half of x1 and 1 half of x2. So I'm taking the average. So basically, right in between, I'm, I'm having the average. So that is x1 plus x2 half. OK? And now you can imagine if you see this like a turning knob. So the, the gamma allo allows you to go from x1 to x2. Great. So far, so good. So that is this one in between here. Now what about that one? So that one is the same construction, right? I have a function value I multiplied with gamma, and I have another function value I multiplied with 1 minus gamma. So I'm interpolating between those two values. And I'm linearly interpolating because my gamma is only appearing to the power of 1. So basically, I'm interpolating with this straight line. So basically, given fx1 and fx2, this thing on the right-hand side here defines this straight line. Okay? And now by saying the function, for all positions in between, should be less than or equal, basically means that the function value here should be smaller than the linear interpolation. Okay? So if I have two points and I draw a straight line between the functional values here, then the function should be below. Great. Maybe you have seen already the notion of convexity not in the context of functions, but in the context of some potatoes on the wall. Okay, so here's a potato. And now you could ask, do I have a convex potato or not? Yeah, next time you eat potatoes, take the potato, and then if you're bored, think about it. Do I have a convex one or not? So this is not a convex potato. And the definition that you might have seen elsewhere is take two points, x1 and x2, and draw a straight line. And if the straight line is inside the potato, then it's a convex potato if you can arbitrarily choose x1 and x2. However, in this case, I can choose these two points, and there's a straight line which is not inside. Now, what is the relation to our functional world here? If I say my area now, my potato, is basically the area above the curve, I could also say the area above the curve, which is an infinite potato, right? It goes up to infinity, should be convex. So that's the relationship between these two definitions. So I could define it first for sets by saying for all points, blah, 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 the linear combination. By the way, the linear combination here is, of course, gamma i plus 1 minus gamma x2. So that's the description of this line here. Yeah, should be inside. Here it says it should be above, which is the same as saying I'm inside. OK, so that is convexity. Um, why is convexity nice? Um, yes, as I said, it's one step away from um, linearity. So in linearity, everything is super simple, right? So, but let's have a little bit more complicated function like a parabola. Then we know, yeah, a parabola, you can also minimize very easily, right? You can just go downhill and you reach some result. Another function which goes like this, so that's not so simple, right? In principle, you know, okay, it can go down here, here, but I'm not sure. Maybe over here there's another minimum, which is even better. And now I have two points, this one and that one. I draw a line, and the line is not completely above the function, so this function is not convex. So why, is then, why are the optimization people so happy about convexity? So they say, um, it's not about linearity or about being like squared function or something simple. The important property for optimization to work very well, to have a unique solution, is convexity. Okay? So the problem is not nonlinearity or something. The problem is non-convexity. So that's what makes optimization problems difficult. Okay, so far so good. What else can we say? So there's another notion called concave, which is the same as convex, but with the minus sign. So if minus f is convex, yeah, it's the one where you basically flip the function down, yeah, 
then the function is concave if minus f is convex. Um, okay, so I said that one already. Then the other thing is nice property of convex functions: a local minimum of a function of convex function is global. So that's awesome. And then we have also Jensen's inequality, which we use. I'm not sure whether today, but we will use it at some other point. I think. Uh, where are we using it? We are using it somewhere. Um, so that looks a bit intimidating. Again, what is this E, right? Didn't we reset our brain? The E is really the expectation that you know. But you know expectation is just another way of saying integration. So it's very related to integration. So it's a summation of some function values. And that should be greater or equal to f of the summation of some input values. So now maybe I should flip it around, because then it directly matches what we've written up here. So this thing up here could be also seen like an expectation, right? Some probability gamma times some value plus 1 minus gamma is another probability times some other value. That's like an expectation. So you can view it much more general like this, OK? OK, so far so good. Where were we? Why do we talk about convexity anyway? Ah, we were in the method of KKT multipliers, OK? And for the KKT multipliers, I said, if my functions f, g, and h um, are all convex, then this method works very nicely, and everything is good. OK, so that is convexity. In particular, there are these so-called KKT conditions. And again, a horrible slide, because there's so much on it. However, let's look at it. The first thing is the optimization problem. You know that one already. The second thing is this generalized Lagrangian function, or KKT function. And then under the assumption that the functions are all convex, there's a theorem. So that fits down here. And this theorem is now saying something about optimal points. So a point w alpha beta, so I have these new variables, yeah, and they get all a star, where the star means they are the optimal one. Yeah? They are optimal, so solve my problem up here, if and only if they fulfill the so-called KKT conditions. Okay? By the way, when you look at the history of this, I think it was a master's thesis. I think one of them is a master's student. But, but look it up, OK? It it's should motivate you to write a nice master thesis to get mentioned like in 50 years on, on slides. So the KKT conditions are as follows. First of all, um, the gradient of the Lagrangian yeah, evaluated at this optimal point must be 0. OK? No surprise here. That's just the first derivative should be 0, OK? Um, then, of course, we want to have that the constraints are fulfilled. So the gi of w star should be less than or equal to 0. So no surprise here. It gets a fancy name. This is called primal admissibility. So admissibility is something like it's a valid solution. It's a possible solution. Of course, we have primal admissibility for the equality constraints. However, we also want to have our dual admissibility. So also the dual solution, the alpha i star, there's a star missing here should be greater than 0. And the only non-trivial condition is the one down here. And it gets a fancy name, complementary slackness. So that basically says that um, this alpha i times the gi, that should be equal to 0 for all i. And how could this be interpreted? OK, if that's the case, um, then either the alpha i is equal to 0. So that's one possibility. And then everything will be fine here in terms of minimizing the w or the g of w is equal to 0. And then this is also fulfilled, and everything is fine here. Okay? So now this g of gi of w is basically when we hit the equality constraint. So this is an inequality constraint, but since they are playing against each other, so minimizing the w might uh, increase maybe the gi. So at some point, I will hit the boundary, and the boundary are the zeros. And so that's basically what the complementary slackness condition here says. That's the one that we will need in a second for the support vector machine. OK? So far, so good. Back to SVMs. By the way, why am I telling you this in all these details? Because this is a general method that you should have in your toolbox. Yeah? So when you have an, another problem somewhere, you should be aware there is mathematical optimization, and it's super powerful. Um, Let's get to the math department and show them my equations. Okay. Back to support vector machines. So let's derive the dual problem. <clears throat> so here it is. So this is the answer. 
Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure whether it's an exercise. So should I show you? I should show you how to derive this on the board, right, as usual. So I do. And if it's an exercise, then you are super lucky. OK? So um, let's try to do this step by step. And I need to do some copying as well. So let's um, first copy our optimization problem. Where do we have it? Oh, it's this one. OK. So let's copy that one. <coughs> OK, I switch camera in a second, so minimize norm of w. I like this notation the most, OK? And I minimize it in terms of w and b. That's funny, right? I mean, there is no b in here, but um, the b will be in the constraints. So subject 2, yi, and then I need the functional margin. I like this notation better, xi plus b. And that should be greater or equal to 1. OK, so far so good. So then I need another Spickzettel here. OK, maybe I can remember that one. OK, let's <coughs> try to write down the Lagrangian, OK? In the Lagrangian now, what parameters do we have? The primary parameters are w and b. OK, so that, those are the primary variables. Great. Um, and now for every inequality constraint, I get dual variables. So I have this alpha. And in matrix differential calculus, the alpha was always a scalar. In the context of support vector machine, the alpha is again a vector. OK? So I'm talking about alpha i and so forth so, and all these things. So 1 half w transpose w plus summation of alpha i times now something that I need to rewrite. So it must be, those must be constraints that are less than or equal to 1. OK, so I need to rewrite this a little bit. How do I do this? Um, let's just bring the 1 to the other side. So I subtract 1 on both sides. So if minus 1, and that is less than, no, that's wrong, greater or equal to 0. Uh, does this already help? No, this is not the right thing. So how was it? It was like this, right? Actually, I need to bring this term to the other side. So that's better, OK? So I will have a 1 minus. All of this is less than or equal to 0. OK, now it's fine. So this term here now just gets copied over there. OK, so let's do that. So this is 1 minus yi. Zack. OK, and it looks to me a little bit wrong. So let me look at on, on, my, on my slides whether I did already a mistake. Um, OK, it's the same. It's just that I put the minus sign over here. OK, and then the 1 and the functional margin, they are flipped. So far, so good. Let's keep it like that, OK? Now the strategy was, OK, actually, I, I now want to have like this expression minimum of my Lagrangian with respect to my primal variables. For this one, I want to have a closed form solution. Because then I have a new problem, and I maximize over my dual variables, which must be greater or equal to 0. So ideally, I can get a closed form solution for that one. Yeah? So in order to eliminate in this expression the w and the b, yeah, I need to calculate the derivative of this one with respect to w and b. And of course, <coughs> I can use matrix differential calculus. But <laughs> let's do it differently in this case. Ah, no, let's use, let's use matrix differential calculus. I advertised it so much, so I should believe in it myself. OK, so let's put a d in front of it, and then let's use it. So I have a d times a half times this guy. So there, basically, I get w transpose times dw. OK, so that's what I get if I do a couple of steps. We've seen it in the lecture. 
Then I have a D in front of the summation, plus summation I, alpha I, it's a constant. That is a constant, so it's D times this part just disappears. So I get a minus sign from over there. I get a YI as well. And then now I'm having the D in front of this expression. OK. So let's write it in front of that expression, D. And now I could either um, go for the W or I go for the B. OK, let's first go for the B. That's easier. So let's say I'm after the B. So then the first term gets irrelevant because the W now is constant, so it disappears. And the back term, I have, OK, so this will be a big bracket again. So the first term disappears, and I have a minus summation over the alpha i, y i. This term is constant, so it disappears, and I have a db. And the db does not depend on my bound variable i, so I can read off the derivative. OK, so that is the derivative. Um, and if I set it to 0, basically what I get is I get the summation of the alpha i times the y i is equal to 0. Or if you like linear algebra, you can also just say alpha transpose times y. So far, so good. Let's go after the w. So I need the first term, and now I need to isolate the w also to the back. First of all, let's flip these like this. So w transpose x is the same as x transpose w. And then I can drag in the d to the w. So what do I get? I get something like w minus summation alpha i yi. And then I have an xi. So there's an i missing. Is it missing everywhere? No, there it is. And transpose, and then I have a d w. OK, great. So this is my derivative. Nice. Setting it to 0 basically says w is equal to this expression. OK, so that implies w is equal to the summation. Let's move this up. Alpha i, y i xi. Interesting, right? Let's check the units, right? w is a vector, and it has the same shape as x. And here, what do we get? We get a linear combination of lots of vectors x that are multiplied by their label and multiplied by some unknown constant alpha, OK? So we see it's a linear combination of the vectors. Always other words, the w is the average of the vectors, where I have some weird weightings in front of it. OK, question? What did we do with the transpose thing? This one? Oh, it just goes away. Are yeah, there are vectors. But basically, if the transpose thing is equal to 0, also the one without the transpose is equal to 0. The other thing is, I think in the identification table for this case, I think there is a transpose sign, and then I'm saying now the gradient is this expression over there. OK? Um, but good that you asked. There are subtleties, and I do mistakes. No question about it. So, OK. So we have now, now a nice expression for w. That sounds nice. So let's see whether we can plug it in here to get rid of the w. OK? And do we have an expression for the b? Um, no, not yet. OK, let's hope for the best that this thing is eliminating the w, as uh, a b. OK, that's the other one that we need to eliminate. OK, so the Lagrangian, L of wb, comma alpha. And now I plug in this expression down here. So I have 1 half, and then this summation multiplied with itself. OK, so let me just write it here so it's blah, 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 transpose times the summation over something blah, blah, blah. 
Okay, in a product it's a linear operation, so I can drag out summations and constant factors. Or maybe I should write it out once. Okay. So I have the summation alpha i, y i, x i transpose times the summation alpha i, y i, x i. Now in order to drag it out, I first need to rename a bound variable. I rename the i to the j on this side. And now I can drag out this summation out of the inner, the, the, this is an inner product of two summations and it's the same as the summation of lots of inner products. So I have a summation over the ij, I can drag out the alpha i, I can drag out the alpha j, the y i, the y j, and the only thing that remains is the inner product of each with each other. So instead of first averaging, first averaging, then calculating the inner product, I can also first calculate all inner products and then average the inner products. Okay? So far, so good. What about the next term? So the next term, we have that one, yeah? It's a summation of the alpha i. Okay. And then we have another term. It's the summation of the alpha i times the rest. And the minus sign, let's drag it out. Minus alpha i times y i, alpha times y i, times these guys over here. Okay. So let's plug again here something in for the w. Oh, I, I removed the, the solution over here, so let's write it just by erasing. Okay. Let's plug in the W. So we use the letter I transpose times XI. Okay, danger, danger. We have too many i's, so let's re rename these inner ones to j, okay, so that we don't get confused. And check this one is bounded by this summation over there. Okay, so far so good. That is the term, the summation alpha i times y i times the first one. However, there's another one. There's summation alpha i with the minus sign of the y i times the beta minus summation alpha i, y i, okay, times the b. Okay, uh, before we deal with that one, let's just check this one here. So the b doesn't depend on the i. I can drag it out, and this one is equal to zero. So it's gone. That's good, the b is, the b, the b is gone. Also, it's good we use the right thing, right? So we use the derivative with respect to b to let it disappear, which is how it should be, okay? So we plugged in this constraint here. So what about that one over here? Again, we can do the same trick as before, do some shuffling. Um, okay, let me, let me just rewrite. Ah, no, let's, let's put a bracket down here and let's rewrite it and then I write it again. So, this summation sign here can be dragged out. These alphas can be dragged out and then I get something which we've seen already before. So, this expression is the same as that one okay, with the minus sign. Where have you seen it before? It's up here. It's the same one as that one. It's identical. That's a bit weird, but when you think about it, so this is a w times w. Okay, we know what we get. We get something like this. Fine. Now, what about down here? So we have a summation alpha i y i times w transpose x i. 
However, if I drag out the w out of this, I have a summation of alpha i y i times x i, and that is w. So it is really the same expression. Okay, since summation over alpha i y i times x i is w. And so this thing is the same as that one. So we need to check the constants in, uh, in, in front of this one. So here we have a minus 1, and here we have a plus 1 half. So the result is a minus 1 half. This thing has a plus sign, so let's take that one first. So we have a summation over the alpha i, that's the first term, minus 1 half, and now again comes this big summation Great. So now we have the Lagrangian function, and we elim eliminated the w and the b, and so we end up with a new optimization problem in terms of alpha, which is maximizing this expression subject to alpha, alpha i being greater or equal to 0. Okay? So that's the derivation of the dual problem. Does it always work so nicely? Some things always work nicely. That just like how this thing is written down with these constants here. Yeah? So they appear linear, and so there are some certain things that just work nice. But it's not necessarily the case that one can get a closed form solution for this problem over here. So far, so good. Any questions to the derivation? Basically, it's. The more that I think of, maybe one could also re rewrite this in a clever way, and then you don't have to write so much stuff. So this can be written, rewritten using this equation here, and then everything gets even easier. Yeah, so there might be a possible way to write it even easier. OK, let's check what we did on the slide. So the story is on the slide, eliminate w and b by plugging in the zero derivatives for the saddle point. OK, I haven't talked about saddle point. Maybe I should drop this word here. But basically, those are the derivatives that we derived, and we set them to 0 and use them to get the dual problem, which is written down here. Now I'm writing here also this constraint, but I think we don't need it. I think it's already used. I need to check that one. I'm not sure. I'm now a bit surprised that I put it here, because I used it already in my derivation yeah, to get rid of the b. OK. Again, I put it here again. So, OK, here's a brief summary. So this is a brief summary of the separable case. Yeah? There's a primal problem. That was the one that we derived with canonical hyperplanes, geometric margin, and so on and so forth, and the idea of maximizing the width of the road. And then using some tools for mathematical optimization, we derived an equivalent problem. And this one, to me, doesn't have so much intuition anymore. Okay. However, it's more easily solvable because the constraints are much easier than this ones. Okay? So the optimizer is typically more happy. However, there's a trade-off, of course. So how many parameters do I have here? So let's say my x are 10-dimensional, yeah? then my w is 10-dimensional, and the b is 1. So I have 11 parameters. Let's say I have 1,000 data points. I will have 1,000 constraints, so my alpha will be 1,000-dimensional. So it can be that the dual problem is much higher dimensional to solve than the primal problem. Okay? However, it will turn out in the nonlinear, non separable case, the w will be in principle infinitely dimensional. Yeah? However, we only have finitely many data points, and then the only way to solve it will be the dual problem. Of course, infinitely dimensional, that sounds a bit like cheating and a bit exaggerating, and that's right. But in principle, they could be infinitely dimensional somehow in some interpretation. OK, here comes the linear SVM algorithm. OK, given some training data, blah, find the alpha that solves the dual problem. And then you can plug in the alpha into our decision function. How do you plug it in? You just plug in the, the w that you calculate from the alpha. OK, so the only question is, how do we get the b, right? How do we compute it from the dual problem? And that follows from the complementary KKT conditions. Hmm, OK, what was that one? So it was a list of conditions, but we only need this one here, this complementary slackness condition, which is written out as 
the Lagrange multiplier times the constraint, and that should be zero for all zeros. And that's something that we get if we solve this dual problem. Yeah, in that case, the complementary KKT condition holds. So how can we use it now to derive B? So we make a case distinction. There are some alpha i yeah, which are greater zero, and some are exactly zero. Yeah, so the ones that are greater than zero. Yeah, those sub i's yeah, have the property that then the constraint, uh, this um, functional margin here, must be exactly equal to one because otherwise we cannot be equal to zero. If the alpha one is positive, then the second factor must be equal to zero, which means the functional margin is equal to one. And in that case, the x i must lie exactly at, like, at the side of the street. Yeah, so it's exactly. Um, like on the margin, so the the points must be one of these points: this one, that one, or that one, or that one. That are exactly here on the street. And those get a name; they are called support vectors. And we put them all in a set S. And then there are the others, yeah. So where we have some some space, yeah. So we could be more strict, but they are greater than one, and there's still some some space that we could use for minimizing the objective in principle. Okay. And they are not called the support vectors. Okay, now to calculate W and B for the W, we just take the formula that we have. It's the average of the xi's, yeah, but multiplied with the signs from the label and multiplied with the alphas. Let's check back. So many points have alpha i being equal to zero, and only a few points have an alpha greater than zero. So the W is really a linear combination of the points. That are here right on the boundary. Okay, so they define the solution. That means if I add another point over here and here, it doesn't change the support vector machine solution because it doesn't influence the margin. However, if I plug a point over here, then probably the angle might change, and I have a new support vector. The other thing is, wow, that's nice, and this summation is very sparse. Okay, maybe I have a million data points, but only three points are support vectors. And only those need to be averaged, basically, to calculate the W. Let's get to the B. So the B is a bit more weird, but for that one, we, we first note that we have this complementary slackness condition from before, and that one can be solved for B, basically. So that is the solution. But of course, it's only interesting for the ones where the alpha i are greater than zero. So only again for the support vectors, we get something useful here because only for the support vectors we have. That the second factor is equal to zero, and if it's equal to zero, we can solve it for b. And if we solve it for b, we just get this expression, which is yeah, the label minus the inner product. Okay, for whatever reason, this is calculating the shift. Actually, you get one divided by y i, but y i is either minus one or plus one, so one divided by y i is the same as y i. Okay, that's another funny step if you want to derive it yourself. And since we have several support vectors, we can average them. But everyone, every of these, each of these should give you the same b approximately. Yeah. But for robustness of algorithms, you average them. Okay. So far, so good. So that's the end of the theory for the linearly separable case. And now it's a quarter to twelve, so I better stop here, and I tell you next time how to implement them. But if you want, you can already look at the code. And I very briefly preview the code. So this is really a big notebook, and it goes through all the different cases. In particular, it's also implementing a solver for quad proc, so for quadratic programming problems, where we have an instance of, and then it shows you how to implement the support vector machine via the dual case and also via the primal case. So have a look at it. It's all spelled out, and at the end you get some. Fancy 3D graphics, so that's fun here with some separating hyperplane where you can see the margin. And just as a preview to to the nonlinear case, you can also have it super fancy, like this, and then suddenly the margin uh, is something like this. So this is really cool. Yeah, but this takes another lecture, I guess, until we get there. So for this, we will need the kernel trick. Good. So far, so good. Thanks for your attention. I see you on Wednesday. <laughs>